Finally today, we speak with Amani Sawari, an organizer with Jailhouse Lawyers Speak, a national collective of imprisoned persons who fight for human rights. This past Sunday, the national prison strike ended after 19 days of coordinated work stoppages, hunger strikes, and solidarity events. Sawari discusses how the strike went, as well as the road ahead. Take a look. So first off, let's talk about the work of organizing this strike. You're uh, an organizer with Jailhouse Lawyers Speak, um, which worked with a lot of different organizations, as I understand it, uh, to put on this strike. Talk about some of the difficulties, particularly in things like communication and coordinating so many prisons uh, that don't have access to the outside very easily. Yeah. So it can be super difficult, especially, like you mentioned, there's communication issues. Not a lot of them have direct access to communication. Um, a lot of them have to use snail mail, which is heavily censored by prison officials. And then on top of that, there's the threat of retaliation. So when strikers are found to be associated with the national prison strike, a lot of them were placed into solitary confinement and their communication was completely cut off. They weren't allowed to send mail, receive mail, get phone calls. So that's one of the biggest barriers is retaliation and then the very limited amount of communication. Their email service, JPay, is paid and heavily monitored. So any mention of the strike, your mail's not going through. The mail people are not going to allow that to pass through their system. They're doing everything they can to suppress the strike and repress organizers. Jailhouse lawyers was very careful in making sure that the, the communications that they were sending out were to the right people. People that uh, were organizing on behalf of JLS were doing their best not to really make a uh, contraband cell phones a huge part of the conversation because places like Lee County in New Mexico, the Lee County prison there, they were doing daily strip searches every day through the strike trying to find those contraband cell phones. Yeah. So people who had them um, were very careful about making sure that they were heavily concealed, but they weren't using them. Uh, most of the time you get a call on Sunday. Sunday is when officials aren't as active. So a lot of calling can happen and organizing can happen on that day. So it's just really working around their schedule, being available when they are, which is usually later in the evening. Because I'm on the West Coast, I'm three hours behind. So they can call me at nine and it's, right. it's no problem, you know, when officials are gone. So it's just working around their schedule. So, uh, so talk about the, the impetus here. Was it something that was brought up by uh, by prisoners on the inside, or was this something that you would, that uh, Jailhouse, JLS had talked about? Where was the impetus for this strike? It's definitely in the heart of the prison. Jailhouse lawyers were the ones who came up with the demand. They whittled the demand down from 35 into 10, just to make it succinct and easier for people to remember and to recall. They called this strike and they wanted it to happen for next year. But after the violent massacre happened in Lee County, where prison officials took away prisoners' lockers and they switched up room assignments, they made really volatile and violent conditions for prisoners. Prisoners knew we have to do the strike now. This could happen in any prison in the United States. It's so unstable and unsafe in our prisons that this is the littlest thing. And it's not a little thing. When lockers are taken away, but on the outside, we kind of see it as a little thing. They have no other way to secure their belongings. And then when room assignments get switched and now they're in rooms with people that they don't know, complete strangers, people they don't trust, rival gangs, that causes tension, that causes conflict, that built and built up, that led to fights that went on for over seven hours, lost seven plus lives. Some reports say nine, some say 12. Officials did immediately transfer people who had died just to kind of keep those numbers down. So prisoners knew this could happen anywhere. And this is unsafe. And we need people to know that the conditions are like this. We saw just last month, 15 prisoners died in Mississippi. Someone lost their life every other day that month due to conditions in the prisons. And it shouldn't be that way. When someone's sentenced to incarceration, they should be able to safely serve their time and have access to the resources that they need to become a better person, to become the, be the person that they want to be. And when that's not happening in our prison on such a large scale, it's not an isolated thing. This is just the culture of the way that United States prison culture is. And so when that's happening, prisoners have, they want to rise up and they are taking the lead in this. And it's really important to understand that they're taking the lead because they're the ones whose lives depend on these changes. 
And so we can trust them in saying, okay, these are the things that need to happen in order for the system to be better. They're not trying to abolish prisons. These demands are not abolishing prison demands. They're let's make this place safer so that we can have livable conditions and, and safe working conditions. And that's what they want right now. So they came up with these demands and they called the strike after that massacre happened in April. So um, and I want to I want to touch upon that that thing about abolishing prisons, because that's that's something that gets sort of tied into the prisons, the national prison strike conversation. So is the is, is the official stance that we're not a, we're not looking to abolish prisons? Is that is that specifically what what your uh, what is part of that uh, message that you're putting out? Okay, so a lot of the organizers personally are prison abolitionists, but that is not a demand of the strike. All 10 of the strikes demand are to make prisons better and safer places for the people that are forced to live and work there. And all 10 demands are about rescinding laws, they're about making conditions more humane, they're about giving prisoners their voting rights, and really just establishing and upholding their humanity while they're incarcerated because they're still human and they're such a valuable part of our economic system. The United States has always been dependent on free slave labor and that is why it has a world power status. So we need to recognize that prisoners do hold a very high place in our economic system and therefore should have a place in our political system. And so that's what they're asking for. They're asking for better conditions while they're incarcerated. The fact that there are a lot of abolitionist groups that are signing on to this is amazing. But I think that the fact that people are tying abolition and the prison strike together is dangerous because a lot of people who see prisons as a necessity, usually out of ignorance, is due to the fact that they're like, oh, oh no, I don't want to abolish prisons. I can't support these demands. If you really look at the demands and read them, none of them have to do with, with burning down prisons or tearing down all prisons. It's about making the places safer for the people who have to live there. And interestingly enough, the the next logical step to making these centers rehabilitation centers rather than punishment centers is that you would uh, basically abolish prisons because you'd have instead you'd have rehabilitation centers, which is not what a prison is 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 meant to be. Um, so talk talk about that list of demands now that the prison strike has has ended. Um, has there been any movement on any of those ten demands that you feel is are, are is successful? There definitely has been movement on some of the demands, which is really exciting because people are really attaching themselves. And I always tell people, you know, even if you don't agree with all 10 of the demands, just find one that you really, really feel that resonates with you, that you can fall behind. Personally, all 10 of the demands really resonate with me. So there's something that I'm all fi that I'm fighting for all throughout. But a lot of people can definitely agree with demand number one. And I feel like that is what people are gravitating towards as well as demand number two. And a lot of movement has been happening with demand number two, majorly because it has been getting the most uh, press attention and media attention. And people are being more conscious about the fact that they're supporting prison labor when they go to establishments like McDonald's and Walmart and, and different places that exploit prisoners' labor, we have to understand that these lower prices are due to the fact that, that a huge part of their employment base isn't being paid what they need to support themselves. The movement has been happening on demand number two, especially, and that's really with the people. It all starts with the people making the decision, okay, we, we don't want to see prisoners exploited, so I'm no longer going to support this establishment until I see that they are paying prisoners fair wages. Prisoners want to have jobs. They want to be able to get out of their cell and move their bodies and do work that's valuable, but they don't want to be underpaid for it. Just because they're serving time doesn't mean that, they're, that their time shouldn't be well spent, that their time shouldn't shouldn't um, have value, but they shouldn't have value in what they're doing. They need to learn how to um, budget and use money and spend money and support themselves. The fact that the system is supporting slavery, and it's written into the Constitution that slavery is just punishment in our country, although slavery was so abusive and detri detrimental in our history to such large populations of people, and I'd argue all people were were punished as a result of slavery being a part of our culture for so long. Everyone failed as a result of that. So for it to be upheld and have a place in our country, in our constitution, in our prisons, is just absolutely disgusting. So I think a lot of movement has been happening with demand number two. People are also finding out about acts like the Truth and Sentencing Act and the Sentencing Reform Act and the 
the Prison Litigation Reform Act. People didn't know about these laws that didn't allow prisoners to get good time while they were incarcerated and didn't allow prisoners to have equal access to the courts while they were incarcerated. And now that they know about these laws, people are making movements and contacting their legislatures. So there's movement happening there. Um, in Texas, the cost, the, the, the prices of phone calls went down from 26 cents a minute to six cents a minute. So there was immediate action in that state as a result of the national prison strike and people choosing to boycott the phones. So the predatory companies that have been preying on prisoners and their families are responding. Um, legislatures are responding. They're taking a look at demands. Um, and then the people are responding by being intentional about their choices and, and where they're spending their money. And I think that those are three of the biggest uh, things that can change, three of the biggest groups that have a hand in, in the prison system. And so the fact that we've raised awareness on such a massive scale as a result of the national prison strike is amazing. Prisoners risk their lives doing this. Um, they will continue to face retaliation, although the end date has passed. They're still in solitary confinement. Their mail is still being censored. They're still, Rashid is up for his uh, transfer hearing today, and he's going to be transferred out of state as a result of his leadership and his doing interviews for the National Prison Strike. So they're still suffering. And, as, and, and knowing this, and as a result of this, we should be upholding those demands and continuing to push them forward and stand behind them in solidarity and in support of them because they need us in order for these actions to happen. And I, I want to talk more about that, but I also want to ask your uh, your opinion on something that has been brought up uh, in sort of the in, re in response to the labor issue. Um, this idea of community service, like you do work to to pay to pay for uh, something that you've done wrong. Is there any sort of commentary or movement on that idea that like, oh, well, they would go out and, you know, I don't know, like build a road or something and then they'd get time docked off of their sentence. Is there any conversation about that or is it just, uh, a, you know, equal pay for equal work conversation? It's an equal pay for equal work conversation when it comes to good time and then having time docked off it that's usually tied into their into their behavior so as a result of someone making an attempt to rehabilitate and to demonstrate a corrective behavior that should be rewarded through their being awarded good time points for their having time taken off of their sentence on the federal level we can see that every single year that someone who's incarcerated has good behavior hasn't been written up hasn't had an incident they have 54 days taken off of their sentence this should this should happen nationwide all around the country there are just three states that are kind of failing in not awarding prisoners good time and that's michigan where there's a good time campaign currently happening um Missouri and North Dakota. And so these states really need to get get with the times and give prisoners their good time. And so when it comes to working and having a job, prisoners should be compensated for that work. They should be able to support themselves. They should be able to, to have a full day's work and still be able to make a $3 phone call and buy a $2 toothpaste and be able to have their, their hair products and, and not be in debt. They should be able to buy a jacket if they need a jacket. They shouldn't have to struggle and be in debt also. And a lot of prisoners, in addition to working, they also have to pay retribution. So sometimes up to 55% of their salary is deducted for retribution. And then when, when they get out of prison, they're still paying retribution fees. So it's like, when are they going to get a break? When are they going to be able to... to to save for themselves and support their families and get a footing so that they can propel out into the world and be prepared for working out into the world. Our current prisons are not preparing people to be productive members of society. They're, they're preparing people to continue to have criminal behaviors and conduct criminal behaviors. All people are learning in prison is how to be a more violent and an unstable individual instead of the other way around. And that's not the way that it should be. Our current system is just a system of warehousing bodies and keeping people incarcerated for as long as possible without learning what they need to learn and developing the skills that they need to become better people. And that's not the way that our system should work. It's not corrective at all. It's not, that's not what the Department of Corrections should be doing. Right. The, the name is ironic. Uh, and of course, that's the, that's the whole point is that, that 
if you get if if it's based on recidivism, then you get those repeat customers, and they really are customers because in a for-profit uh, prison industrial complex, you get paid for the number of bodies that are that are in jails. And uh, you know, for instance, a lot of states they have these the, these contracts with these private uh, correction facilities, and they say, oh, we need ninety eight percent of beds filled. Well, then the mm -hmm. state has to put people in jail for bullshit reasons because they got to keep those beds filled. Exactly. Exactly. And for our, so, our system to be profiting off of people's lives being destroyed is really disgusting. So, mm -hmm. that, yeah. yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying. Um, so... Let's uh, let's talk not because uh, we've we, you've mentioned a little bit the responses, the retaliations and things like that, but also the positives uh, movements on those 10 points. Have you been able to get a sense of the inmate response, like how people on the inside have responded to the strike? Do they feel that it was a success? Are they looking to do it again? Definitely. And it was it was definitely successful looking at the fact that prisoners on uh, the average prisoner doesn't have a cell phone can't just call their buddy up and say, hey, a national prison strike is happening. Um, and then on top of that, they can't even write in a letter that the strike is happening because that's going to get censored and thrown out. Um, so the fact that they've been able to organize on such a massive scale um, during the strike, at least 14 states have reported, confirmed reports of their participation from New York to Florida to California to Washington, all corners of our country were, were participating in the national prison strike. And so for prisoners to have organized on such a wide scale in the country and then also outside of the country, there was striking happening in solidarity with the national prison strike in Burnside prison in Burnside prison in Canada. And then there was also solidarity that came out of Greece and from prisoners in Israeli prisons, um, Palestinian prisoners. So the fact that this has been able to spread on such a massive scale in two and a half weeks is amazing. And so I really commend the prisoners who've been organizing this and every single prisoner who took the risk to say, I'm not going into work today, even under the, the extremely volatile conditions that they live under. They took the risk. It's it's not as easy as a construction worker putting down their hard hat and, and striking. These people are risking their lives. They're risking their livelihood. Prisoners lost their jobs for striking. Um, Prisoners lost their jobs for striking. Their their uh, prisoner status went up. So, for example, if you're a level two and you refuse to do your job, you can go up to a level five. And the difference from being a level two and a level five, one of the hugest ones is contact visits. Now you're not able to sit next side to side with your family member on a visit. You have to see them through glass. So these are really big risks and and threats to their to their entire lifestyle while being in prison not to mention the way that they're treated by prison officials who feel inconvenienced by their choice and then they're not having an, an earning even as small as it is earning pennies a day is more than earning zero cents a day so prisoners just taking the risk to to not go into their jobs to boycott being on the phone the phones are these are their only ways of hearing their loved ones voices and they're taking that risk just to not do that for two and a half weeks. There were there are men in Michigan's Alger Correctional Facility who made the choice not to use the phones during the strike. And that's a huge sacrifice for them not to, to be able to call their, their, their family members and their friends for that long amount of time and to be in that environment and not have that outlet. So also for prisoners to be doing to be doing sit ins and to just sit in this space. And, and take up that space and peacefully protest and refuse to move when officials are asking them to move. So long as it's not locked down, they don't have to move. So for them to just stand up against the system and recognize, you know, I hold space here. I'm of value here. And I'm making the choice to use my body to protest the way that I'm being treated, the abusive way that, I, that I'm treated by the people who are supposed to be protecting me. That's huge. And so prisoners have been able to do that on a large scale. And it, it was extremely successful in that respect. And because they took that risk, the entire world was able to see, okay, this is a big deal. Prisoners are risking their lives. They're risking their status. They're risking relationships with their loved ones on the outside. They're, they're risking their ability to communicate with others. They're risking their earning potential just to prove this point that all 10 of these demands are crucial in order for us to make a really transformative change in our criminal justice system.
yeah, it was, it was right. very successful. And of course, the I mean, the, there's so much power there because it shines a light on something that is 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 hidden from most people. Because you know, just like you know, people say, "Oh, well, you know, slavery was so overt and that's so terrible." And now that it's behind bars, it's kind of sanitized in a way that people don't have to deal with it on a daily basis. But it gets really uncomfortable when that light is shone on it, and you have to address it. And yeah. then having to address that is is an incredibly powerful point that is that has been taken from the from the strike from the those prisoners making taking those risks as you mentioned mm -hmm. um so part of this is also you know i've seen some petitions online you know please sign this and we're, we're going to send it to congress uh would you say that congressional action is part of this goal and and if so what type of actions would you be looking for what type of legislation so yes after the strike only a few days before the strike ended, JLS contacted me and said that the next step is uh, congressional action because we can't hold legislatures accountable for what they don't know. At this stage, JLS wants to educate legislatures and let them know, hey, national prison strike happened and these were the demands. These many people risked their lives in these many prisons in these many states. And we need you to know that this is what they're asking for and this is what they want. So yes, congressional action is the next step. and some of the biggest things that we want to see are the rescinding of the prison Lit litigation reform act the rescinding of the truth and sentencing laws the rescinding of the sentencing reform act acts that make it mandatory for people to stay incarcerated regardless of how many classes that they take and how their behavior has improved and how they're diligent and committed to their their work and their communities and how they've been demonstrating that they want to progress in life. If people are reformed, they should be out of prison. That, that means that our system was successful. Okay, this person was able to, to adjust and change their ways, but the that is decreasing and decreasing. As you say, the, the recidivism rate has gone up and up and up because people aren't given that opportunity to have a chance to reform themselves and have access to taking classes, taking programs, and really developing mentally, physically, and emotionally. Our system right now is committed to destroying people's lives, destroying them and breaking them down. And that's that's not what we should have. So prisoners want to have access to demonstrating that they are reformed and they want to have access to making the choice. You know, people say, oh, not everyone should get out of jail early. I believe that's true. Not everyone should be able to get out to be able to get out of jail early, but everyone should have the opportunity to demonstrate that they should get out of jail earlier due to their their diligence and their progression in behavior and they're taking classes and earning certificates. Some men have earned multiple doctorate degrees while they're in prison. Should they not be able to come out and contribute to our society with that newfound knowledge and their experiences? We want those people back in our world. These people are fathers and husbands and wives and mothers and, and big brothers. People are have lost huge parts of their lives people have lost their son to the system and they should be able to come back out into the world and contribute to our society we can't demonstrate com a complete cycle of healing without giving them the opportunity to to serve our communities again so those would be some of the biggest first steps rescinding of those acts that force people to stay in prison longer and and diminish prisoners access to the courts because right now there's no a body that holds prisons accountable for the for the violation to human rights that are happening on a daily basis. Prisoners are just being revolved inside of the internal grievance processes, which involve the same people that abuse them investigating their cases. And so we need to to reenact that body that protects prisoners' rights. And that really demands a rescinding of the Prisoner Litigation Reform Act. And so those would be three of the biggest policy changes that we'd want to see immediately on a congressional level. To hear the full interview with Amani Sawari, check out our social media as well as our podcast, where we will include the full conversation. And for more on Amani Sawari and her work, visit her website at sawarime.org.